Oh, that over to you. Steve had said to me, if I go beyond eight minutes, he will have military reinforcement. So I have to be careful. I enjoyed listening to the previous speaker. However, I have a slight difference with him. The US remains the major power in the Middle East. And the Soviets have made inroads, which they lost once Sadat came and threw them out. Uh, today, the Russians have made headways because of their success in Syria, because they flirt with Iran, they flirt with uh, Turkey, and they also flirt with Saudi Arabia. However, the US today and Russia, in my view, have realized that their proxies have to be under control. Otherwise, the Middle East would become more of a mess. And therefore, I expect that the US and Russia will have more control on their allies. Otherwise, they could destabilize the area more, they'll create more chaos. And I don't think Trump or Putin want to get involved in wars in the Middle East. That's, in my view, is I'm optimistic that if we can have the two powers try to stabilize the region, get them to uh, talk. Now, in the past, we heard a lot about hegemony. But the way the Middle East is structured today, you have several major regional powers. You have Turkey. You have Iran. You have Saudi Arabia. You have Egypt, and of course, Israel. None of these powers, based on the current situation and the attitude of Russia and America, could never be the hegemon of the Middle East. It would remain unstable, but no one, no one power would dominate. And I think none of these powers want to really have a war going on. I don't think Netanyahu wants to go to war. I don't think the Iranians want to have a war that would be devastating to them. And the Kurds realize that a war will also weaken Turkey because of the Kurdish situation. So an American-Russian cooperation is in the interest of the region. I hope they can cooperate to make the region more prosperous. I would like to talk, when we talk about the region, we always talk about politics. But I think the economics are far more dangerous than the politics. The economics are more complicated. I just want to give you one example. Today, we have 400 million Arabs. By the year 2050, we will have 800 million Arabs. And by the year 2085, according to projections that are realistic, you will have 1.4 billion Arabs. How are you going to feed these people? How are you going to create jobs for these people? How are you going to keep the area stable? Where are you going to get enough water? These are the issues I think that most of us don't talk about. And these are the issues that I think will determine whether the, the Middle East will be more chaotic, more dangerous, more violent. What happened in 2011 and the various uprisings, for the most part, were mainly economic, but also were due to repression and mismanagement. So that's, in my view, a topic that has to be dealt with. And that's a topic where reform is necessary for prosperity. But to have reform, in my view, you can't be a reformer if you're not a believer in the rule of law. You cannot bring prosperity and growth without an independent judiciary. You cannot grow 
unless you have a good education. And therefore, the restructuring that has to take place, it begins with education. It begins with creating a culture of venture capitalists. Arabs are great traders. They're great merchants, but they are not industrialists. You see Arabs investing in hotels or in real estate, but I can't find a single Arab capital venture people. There is no Steve Jobs. There is no Apple. There is, it's lacking because we, you don't have that culture. And a venture culture requires taking risks. And that's something that has to be taught. That's something that has to be embedded. If you look at Arab investments, they're e either in bank deposit, treasury deposits, stocks. I find many Arab entrepreneurs in America who have ideas, who want people to finance them. But yet, when they go to the region, they can't get any financing because of their risk element. That is, in my view, a key reform that should be undertaken. How do you create entrepreneurs? Otherwise, you're not making things. And that's the problem in the Arab region. They don't make anything. They export oil. I was in China two years ago. And I, I was so impressed. In 1978, the per capita income in China was something like $600. Last year, it was over $7,000. But you see Chinese shirts, you see just Chinese marble. And if the Arabs don't follow the concept of being risk takers, making things, the, the, the region would be more dismal. One last thing I want to talk about, and that is Palestine. You know, this issue is not going to go away. Right now, it's not a priority on the international scene, but it's an issue that resonates with Arabs and Muslims. And we keep talking about a two-state solution, but so far, nothing's happening, but it, it's not sustainable. And we talked about a two-state solution last year. The Arabs have put the Arab peace plan. And I hope Mr. Netanyahu will put an Israeli peace plan, especially in view of what Trump and Kushner are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adet. It's great. Look, I mean, the dilemma of the Palestinians seizes me quite a lot, having covered the region some. And Abu Mazen seems very lonely. Succession is, isn't clear. Gaza and the West Bank are split, and no one really wants to hear about it. And maybe we will elsewhere in the panel, but thank you.